So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Sandra Diaz, is a leading world authority on plant diversity and plant biodiversity and, and on ecosystems, plant functional traits and platforms of functional specialization. Uh, she combines her plant ecology studies with interdisciplinary work on how societies value and reconfigure biological communities and ecosystems. And that's a theme she'll be pursuing today. Uh, Sandra, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, I, I am a macroecologist. I hope you can hear me well. I really feel very honored to be a part of this uh, series of webinars. One of the most remarkable things about plant life on Earth is its astonishing diversity of form and function. As well as being a continuous source of exploration, this poses a formidable challenge. If we are to understand and manage biodiversity and ecosystems, we can't deal with each species as a separate case. We need to identify some general principles underpinning this exquisite complexity. So we set out to describe essential axes of specialization at the level of the whole plant, at the global scale, and considering all three major functions in a plant's Darwinian struggle for existence, growth, ex survival, and reproduction. In order to make this operational, we needed to find a minimum set of plant traits that together would encapsulate all these functions and at the same time would be available for a very large number of species worldwide. So we finally settled for plant height, seed or spores mass, leaf mass per area, leaf nitrogen content, leaf lamina size, and step, stem specific density. Thanks to the TRI Global Communal Database of Plant Traits, we managed to build this data set. It contains a very wide variety of vascular plants, and it contains also the most extreme values of these fundamental traits known to science. And it includes over 40,000 vascular plants. So still to this day, and to my knowledge, this is the largest data set in the world in terms of species mean values and geographical and botanical breadth. And what we wanted to do with this is to find out how the multidimensional trait space occupied by living vascular plants look like. What was its outer shape and how were species distributing within this volume? So if we imagine a six dimensional volume, each dimension corresponding to one trait. If every combination of trait values were possible and equally popular, then we would observe a hyperdimensional, quasi spherical, serenely homogeneous cloud or blob. So we, do, we did build the observed, the empirical, six dimensional trait space. And you can see here some three dimensional projections of it. And then we tested this observed hyper volume against a group of formal, formal uh, mood models. And in a word, we found that the observed phenospace of vascular plants is definitely not a quasi-spherical homogeneous cloud. There are strong constraints to what combinations of traits are possible or at least likely. The multidimensional trait space is rather flat and constrained. 
like the galactic disk of the Milky Way. Or using a more domestic metaphor, if you like, like a flat bread. The trade space actually occupied is so constrained that about three quarters of the whole variation is captured by a single plane. This plane, which we name the global spectrum of plant form and function. This plane has two major axes of variation. One axis is in this direction, reflects the size of whole plants and their leaves and seeds, goes from small plants with small leaves and tiny seeds, all the way to very tall plants with large seeds and large leaves. From that width to Brazil nut. The second major dimension, this one, is a leaf resource economics axis from conservative, slow living leaves like those of holly or even more conservative, the Australian hackers, all the way to acquisitive, tender, short-lived leaves like those of basil. This is the first global picture of essential functional diversity of vascular plants. Now, let me show you now some illustrations of the kind of plants located at the fringes of uh, this plane for your reference. Here in this area, we have the Brazil nut, pines, junipers, and monkey puzzles here, hackers, heathers, large floating and tiny submerged aquatic plants, the tender but toxic devil snares and henbanes. And because many of you work in genetics and molecular biology, I thought you would be interested in knowing where is Arabidopsis talion. It's here, as you can see, in a remote, sparsely populated corner of the functional galaxy. So um, this spectrum of form and function can be used as a backdrop as a navigation chart on which one can place any vascular plant species or community on earth, and can also be used to understand the selective and evolutionary trajectories of these plant entities in the past and in the face of ongoing and future environmental change. And the global spectrum is actually being used and furthered in a number of projects worldwide. The first question these uh, new projects address is, are these two dimensions enough? The simplicity of the global spectrum is actually its strength and beauty rather than a weakness because you can capture with it the essential design of any plant entity with only two quantitative continuous coordinates based on well-established theory and applicable to the vast majority of vascular plants. But this spectrum doesn't encapsulate everything that is important to a plant. This pattern should be seen as a minimal set in the mathematical sense. Any functional description of what the plant does should consider them, but it doesn't mean you are going to be able to explain everything with these patterns. For example, only last week, we published a new paper on how fine root traits map onto the global spectrum of plant form and function. And we found that fine roots actually add some non-redundant meaningful information to the global trade space of plants. Here you have uh, the global spectrum as I just described, and this is dimensions uh, three and four of PCA, which are all fine root traits. 
But this and all the analysis I have seen so far, in the, when, when they incorporate new traits, the extra dimensionality doesn't override the first plane. So going back to the flat bread analogy, the trait states occupied by vascular plants is not totally and homogeneously flat like a Mexican tortilla. Rather, it looks more like a chipati or pita bread with varying thickness, with lumpier and flatter places, but the hyper volume is still predominantly flat, dominated by size and leaf resource economics. Another important point which I thought you would be interested in is the fact that this is a plane only in the mathematical sense. But if you add a probability density to it, which in this map has been represented by the colors, you actually get a topography, a landscape, with red hot peaks, which I call uh, functional hotspots with many species that are very similar in terms of their functional trait combinations, highly redundant if you wish, and also other much paler, colder valleys like this, which I call cold spots. These valleys represent trait combinations that I either not observe or do exist, but are very uncommon. Indeed, we were expecting constraints to the multidimensional space, but we were not expecting this striking topography. And this topography is not the result of some odd splurge in speciation at some point of evolution. As you can see, many distant families and orders are located in these hotspots, indicated that these are successful solutions found repeatedly over the evolutionary history of vascular plants. Now, on the other hand, some perfectly viable combinations of traits from the biomechanical and physiological point of view uh, are very rare or definitely don't exist. Uh, presumably because they are eliminated by or are under strong negative selective pressure from natural selection. Now, the question we and other colleagues asked us next was, can this topography of the functional landscape of vascular plants change over time? Can the peaks and the valleys shift? And do we humans have a role in it? You are probably all well aware of the dramatic extinction rates of many organisms at the moment as a result of anthropogenic causes. And plants are not exception. But these general numbers obscure the fact that different kinds of plants appear to be threatened to very different degrees and in very different ways. And these taxa happen to be placed in very different areas of the global spectrum. So we use the sample red list, which is a non-biased version of the red list of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and mapped these species from the sample list onto the global spectrum. This still work in progress, but quite roughly, least concerned species seem to be spread everywhere in the spectrum. 
near threatened species are more restricted and threatened species are disproportionately located on the right side of the plane and especially the southeast corner, so to speak. And this corner happens to be an area in trade space that might have been a hotspot in the distant past, but no longer is one. So here you get low redundancy as well as disproportionate threat. So this area here is a blinking red traffic light in the functional space of vascular plants. But human pressure is not only about thinning already thin areas of the global uh, plant phenospace. We found something interesting in this particular area of the spectrum, which is a really acquisitive nitrogen rich, live fast die young neighborhood. This is the area in which are located most of the species strongly related with us, either because they are our crops, very domestic weeds, or they are sources of poisons or recreative or medicinal or traditional drugs for decades, centuries, millennia. You don't get a species hotspot here, because in the wider picture of the world's flora, there are not that many species in that particular corner. But if you look at the level of varieties, there is a huge concentration of them. And they are disproportionately important to us and to a very large degree created by us. So this is a natural functional cold spot in Fino space, in which we have been trying to build a warmer spot for millennia. But our deliberate sculpting of plant form and function, remarkable as it is, has involved only a tiny fraction of the whole Fino space of plants. So wrapping up, the phenospace of vascular plants is remarkably constrained and lumpy. The variation is largely concentrated into a plane, the global spectrum of plant form and function, defined by plant and organ size on the one hand and leaf tissue quality on the other. This plane doesn't capture everything that is important about plants. It has to be seen as a minimal set. Other dimensions are likely to enrich the spectrum, but so far appear much less important. The spectrum is strongly granular with strong conversions towards a relatively small set of successful trait combinations. And finally, the present model of human appropriation of nature has clearly been shifting and is likely to continue shifting the topography of the global spectrum. To finish, I would like to share with you two wider informal corollaries. First, despite their amazing superficial variety, most vascular plants share similar combinations of these six essential traits. And second, despite our amazing capacity to manipulate plant form and function, our deliberate sculpting of phenospace space has been focused on a tiny corner of the global spectrum. And at the same time, we have been cause, causing highly biased collateral damage in other regions of trade space. And I would like to thank all the colleagues that participated in this work. Thank you very much. <laughs>